Good evening. Welcome to the Sanctum Secorum podcast, where we plumb the depths of Appendix N as it pertains to the Dungeon Crawl Classics role-playing game. We are here to help you serve these literary offerings at your DCC RPG table. I am Keeper Jen, and with me tonight, as always, we have Keeper Bob. Hey, everybody. And the amazing Keeper Mark. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Sorry, Bob's amazing too. I just didn't want it to seem like pandering. <laughs> My ego is fine. <laughs> uh, and tonight we, uh, oh, I'm so sorry for the pun. We burrow to the center of the earth <laughs> with a classic novel from over a century ago. Written by the creator of Tarzan, tonight we'll be discussing Edgar Rice Burroughs' At the Earth's Core. Take it away, Bob. David Inns is a mining heir who finances the experimental Iron Mole, an excavating vehicle designed by his elderly inventor friend, Abner Perry. In a test run, they discover the vehicle cannot be turned, and it burrows 500 miles into the Earth's crust. They discover that the Earth is a hollow shell as they emerge into the unknown interior world of Pellucidar. Pellucidar is inhabited by prehistoric creatures of all geological eras and dominated by the Mehars, a species of flying reptile both intelligent and civilized, but which enslaves and preys upon the local Stone Age humans. Inns and Perry are captured by the Mehars' ape-like Sagoth servants and taken with other human captives to the chief Mehar city of Futra. Among their fellow captives are the brave Gach, the hairy one from the country of Sar. Is it Sari? Sari. The shifty Huja, the sly one, and the lovely Diane, the beautiful of Amaz. Well done. I mean, <laughs> is, is it is it Dion or Diane or? Well, so so there is there is what there, there's the book, there's the audio book, and there's the movie, um, which oh, which we one. which I read, listened to, and watched, and uh, <laughs> I think they went with uh, Dion in the movie and maybe in the audio book. It was Diane, uh, like Diane, but Diane in in the audio version. Anyway. Um, that was the movie. I've never seen it. The movie was actually surprisingly good. I was I was quite impressed. So the movie came out in 1976, and uh, it has Peter Cushing. Oh, cool! So yeah. so that was that was really cool. <laughs> Guess which um, Cushing played? <laughs> and, and so it was it was a lot of fun for what it was. I mean, it's. It's 1976, right? So our our monsters are mostly you know, men in rubber suits, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, it was fairly faithful, and it was it was a lot of fun. It was better than it had any right to be for a 1976 adaptation of anything, really. Uh, so <laughs> it was, played Perry, and it was spot on. It was. Perfect. Um, but then again, this is the same guy that has portrayed Sherlock Holmes, so of course we like him. Um, can can we go back to the the test run being the actual run? <laughs> well, that oh the, gosh, <laughs> they thought it could turn. It, it's sort of like oh, WKRP. No. I swear, I thought turkeys could fly. They swore they thought the thing could turn. And, and yeah, it, it, it I'm, I'm so perplexed already. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we, we have... But, it, but it's very it's very much DCC. It gets you right into the action right away. There's no preliminaries at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there's no turning radius on this manticore. <laughs> well, and, and Burroughs, Burroughs is, is fairly well known for just sort of jumping you into the midst of things, right? I mean, if if there's kind of a, a quiet moment, he will rush past it as quickly as possible to get back to the action. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, kind of he, writing he, for that's what sells. Yeah. yeah. He abbreviated a lot of the the sort of in-between, you know, transition scenes. You know, I think there was one time when 
you know, they're journeying. And, and of course, time is something we'll talk about as far as, you know, the, the perception of time, and things like that. But there's like a paragraph where it's basically like, and then we had all these adventures and encounters and, you know, and, and then we, you know, rejoined the, here in the story. Um, so yeah, there is that kind of like, you know, serialized approach of, well, we have to, you know, get to the the next set of things that people are going to really be interested in. Exactly. Well, and it's, it's really amazing. I mean, you look at, you look at the stuff that pops up and again, this is all, you know, pre-internet age, right? It's not like you could look up various details very easily. I mean, you had libraries, obviously, but Burroughs led such a weird and fascinating life from being a pencil sharpener wholesaler to being a cowboy, right? I mean, uh, I think his wide and varied experiences sort of come come into play not just in in what he experienced but the people he experienced as well because i'm I'm willing to bet that huja the sly one is probably based on someone that he met a couple times right (laughs) oh that that's funny that gets me to thinking of jack vance and how he was naming characters after people (laughs) (laughs) oh boy well um I think that first scene is probably one of my favorites based on the fact that they're going through all of these different climates and oh, yeah. then you, you get the, uh, I keep wanting to call him professor. Uh, I guess technically he was, he was the scientist. He goes from praying to cursing and you know, that that's something like a pirate. Really. Yeah. Well, there was the, the, that certainly that element, you know, in, in the first scene is sort of after the book ends, right, that we have where this is a narrative that is a relayed story, right? So the, the yeah. sort of like the introduction to this is that there is this explorer who encounters um, uh, David uh, in in the Sahara. And, you know, this is, uh, we find out later that this is when David has returned, you know, but wants to to go back under um, the, the surface of the world, but he wants to take all these, you know, modern things with him. And, you know, that's sort of the, the, the very short introduction. And at the end, there's a sort of like, you know, open-ended what happens, right? You never heard, hear something again. But I think, Jen, that's right, that, that like sort of tension that, you know, they're going deeper and deeper and, you know, not really, you know, they're, they're sort of ex- expressing what the readers are going through, like, you know, this is an area that they have no knowledge of. And, you know, the, the fact that there's these temperature fluctuations and pressure in this like sort of doomsday scenario that Perry sets up of, well, we only have this much fuel and we're going to, we, we can go 800 miles, but we'll be dead at 500, you know, it's <laughs> this sort of fatality yeah. to it. And, and there are several moments in the book of this, you know, almost hopelessness, right? You know, the, sen- the sense of everything is lost and, and, the, and David, the protagonist goes through this a lot where it's like rescued at the last moment, you know, and, uh, and that's, that, that's sort of set up in, and the journey that they go through. But I like that journey part, yeah. Well, and the book is I mean, the book is such an influential piece of fiction. I mean, let's you know, serialized in 1914. It took eight years to be published as a book. It took 48 years to hit paperback. And it took, what, 50, if like 50 or 60 years before it hit a movie. But it it. it partially inspired Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness. Mm. It influenced uh, Lynn Carter's Xanthodon series. And there are a few Lovecraftian scholars who have stated that the Sagoths were the inspiration for the naming of Lovecraft's slave race, the Shuggoths, who are Mm. the slave race to the, the elder, the elder things and at the mountains of madness so i mean you've got this this huge sort of appendix n building on some of the earliest appendix n which makes this a, a lot of fun and I you can say do it, so many it things came, with it. it came across a lot less uh shall we say problematic than the first tarzan story it has its moments in earlier episode even even the uh, romantic interest, uh, I thought that theme was handled much better than others have been uh, in its time, and even of Burroughs' own writing. Yeah, I mean, it, there's... It was very... It, it, it was a lot less uh, derogatory, 
I should say. There, there are still a few racial depictions that are that are more of the time, and certainly uh, wouldn't wouldn't uh, fly today. But they're nowhere near as as prevalent or overtly negative. Out there, yeah, <laughs> as, Over, as they are good word. Yeah, it it to me as I was reading it, I was like reflecting. This is gosh, this is more than a hundred years old, and it didn't feel like that. You know, it feels a, you know more modern in some sense. You know, there are. Like you said, some things of its time, you know, the the whole I'm waiting for a white man or the comparison of, you know, some of the the racial you know comparisons that, that happened early in the book. But I think on a whole, it's it feels very much like, you know, a, a much more modern novel than I would have expected or did expect, you know, going into because I was thinking 1914, 1917, you know, that's that has its own specific sort of, you know, feel to it. And there's very little of like the sort of anachronistic things that yeah the language thinking. doesn't seem as as cumbersome as some other pieces of the period do yeah there's i mean there's a, a few references to things like you know telegraphs right you know that was sort of like the the technology right and then they, but there's a, there's very few and it's kind of fun when you see them but these sort of like colloquial or slang terms um that come up you know like corker <laughs> it's like that's, yeah yeah that's like one of those things. but you you hear that in in reference in in you know culture too you know like in older movies and things like that so it didn't feel so specific that it it was a, abrasive, right, from a, a reader standpoint. And I like that. You know, I, I like the fact that it it didn't feel aged or, you know, something that wasn't approachable. Well, and it just it moves along so nicely that once once you pick it up and start reading, you just go. You go from beginning to end. It doesn't really there's no big lags. So it's just it's a great adventure story. Yeah. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah, I, I I think that, like you said, Jen, there's a there's an element to this sort of, you know, what I was sort of thinking when I was reading it is that this love story, you know, is 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 told in a way that's that's sort of inviting speculation about, OK, I, you know, obviously they're going to fall in love. Right. They're, that's sort of like the the ultimate thing. But, you know, there's this tension and, and, and many times it's like they they see like they're going to walk away from each other. Right. You know, so there's this sort of like fun element of, you know, just you know that they're they're angry or they're, they're he almost gives up at one point and walks across the valley but decides to return and and then it gets a little cliche you know with you know them saying oh, i loved you always you know well, you know it, you know why didn't you just express yourself by forcing yourself on me to some extent you know, so, you know but um you know i, I think why it, didn't you claim me publicly yeah yeah uh, yeah or release me <laughs> right and that ties into the whole Hey, I can almost believe you're not from this land because you don't know this custom. Although you can tell it was a serialized piece because I counted at least three repetitions of it. Well, yeah, you know, I, well, and the thing is, I don't know if it was. I thought from when I was looking at it, the the story was bought and then broken broken down to serialize. I don't think it was sold as a serial because he had only he'd only been publishing things for about three years. I mean, the first the first story was Under the Moons of Mars, which became uh, Princess of Mars, the first Barsoom story. And he sold that as a whole story and it was just serialized. So it might have been the same way. You might just simply have, have repeated it for emphasis through the story or for word count, right? Because, you know, uh, he did... Burroughs did say that he wrote as an escape from poverty. So I mean, it's it's uh, it was it was really important in his life to 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 write and and make money and make money he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see these being you know like you said influential, but also I, I assume they were very popular, right? Just because of the adventure and the the heroism and you know the, and the the science fiction aspects, right? You know, this is sort of very much like right after H.G. Wells and and sort of like building on that and but it's it's very much integrating that with this you know heroic arc right and these these kind of like you know protagonists that are sinewy and muscular and you know you know they're they're able to take on these challenges and survive them um so it's it's very much of that sort of adventure story pulp novelization well it's it, it, right 
<laughs> well, and, and mentioning his heroes, I mean, when when Inns describes himself as you know peak physical condition, and I play this sport, <laughs> this sport, and this sport, there were like shades of Flash Gordon, right? I am mm. the perfect human specimen because I have decided to be the perfect human specimen, and uh, and that and was that was kind of interesting. Then he introduces Perry to the the Seoths as a religious man. Right. I thought that was a genius play because they moved Perry to a different area of this, I guess, uh, hostage camp. Uh, And then he gained access to the library. So Mm -hmm. we started finding out all these interesting things about their captors and the captors masters because these were just like the underlings yeah it was uh, i don't i don't know if i even want to talk about the mayors <laughs> well there there is this like interesting sort of horror element that's present yeah. you know at various points in the novel that's that's i found you know just fascinating that was that was present and sort of ex- explicit in that regard like you know there's a scene where David is, you know, basically condemned to this experimentation chamber, and it's it's right out of, you know, some, you know, uh, horror uh, genre, right? You know, he's seeing like this sliced open uh, vivisection that's happening to other prisoners, and he's sort of this very palpable fear that he has, you know, that that lends himself to, you know, escape and and you know, leave. There's the the temple that they. They, sub- you know, they observe like you know the the ritual of this mayhar you know ability to like hypnotize you know with this sort of bobbing and swaying motion and then it's described in this detail it's not just a quick bite of you know uh, of ending this this person's life you know the the captain's life it's like segmenting an arm and another arm and then you know this sort of like again totally and just... this time without a torso <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so there it's it is it's kind of this it's neat, you know, because I, I think that that's something I was also kind of surprised by, especially for the time, you know, just in, in terms of like how, you know, how, yeah. how, how, you know, how those things are, were woven in there. So I like those, those things because I think they were just, they, you, it really made me feel what David was feeling to a certain extent, right? You know, it took him out of that sort of like himself setting up this like Uber man, right? You know, this, it, this sort of like, I can, I can do anything. I'm the peak person in in the upper world to really being thrown into this you know this lower world uh, underneath the, the surface where he doesn't have access to the you know the tools and the technology and he feels vulnerable and those and those are kind of the more captivating moments when, he, when he's exposing his vulnerability well and and Burroughs's Pellucidar if you if you look at the way he describes essentially how how it's set up and how it works right where they burrow down and then gravity shifts once they hit a particular point. So rather than going down, they were going up. And then there's the, the burning kind of magma surface of the Earth's core beyond. That's a lot like the, uh, the imagery that hollow Earth conspiracy theorists use today. Um, it's similar to what they did in uh, was it, uh, King Kong versus Godzilla not all that long ago. A lot of the the tones and imagery that he created over a hundred years ago linger in in popular culture and popular misconception, uh, and uh, it it just it makes for really really good reading. I will add, however, that the movie is very uh, is very short on uh, dismemberment. They 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 don't go into that in the in the nineteen seventies. Uh, Costumes but, are actually halfway decent <laughs> but, for the time. But oh my god, the the book the book really does. You're right. It, it has that horror feel at at times. It's it's this mm-hmm. grand adventure, and then these moments of sincere darkness. Yeah, yeah. And I'll I'll shout out. There's one point where there's a flat earther. You know, in, in the in the novel, he's trying to convince him that this world is uh you know convex or cave, and it's like you're you're an idiot. It's flat. It goes on you know forever. But yeah, to <laughs> Which... your point, yeah. It, Which is hysterical, it. since early on in the book, Perry is is pointing to the horizon, saying, "Look, you can see that it curves <laughs> upwards. Yeah. Uh, the horizon doesn't drop away; it curves up." Yeah. So, so even even more than a hundred years ago, there were people that were just. What What did you guys make of the 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 time perception that kept 
coming up again because it it wasn't one of those things that was clearly defined. It was just more of this feature, right? You know, and it's it's also just one of those things that you know, there's this one sort of jarring moment when Perry is re-encountering David, who's been away on this journey, and he says, "You just left like a a minute ago, you know, from when I left you at the you know when you escaped." But I didn't. Was there some explanation that was was surrounding that, or was it just intended to be this? You know, under the the surface, this this is how time works. It doesn't work the same way as it does, you know, outside. Well, it's constantly daylight too, so they have. Yeah, to I, I couldn't tell if it was no psychological or it's intended to be some yeah. physical, you know, representation of of you know how time is is measured. Well, that's you know, right. That's how David knew he was gone for a couple of days because he had eaten three times and mm -hmm. slept twice. Yeah. Well, e even at the beginning, right, when he discovers he's been gone for 10 years and he could swear it's been no longer than a year. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there's really no explanation for the, for the differences in the flow of time, but it really gives Pellucidar a dreamlike, almost hallucinogenic quality. Yeah, it, it's it's very very ethereal and otherworldly in that respect. It'd be fun, something fun to play around with, you know, and and see how you could adapt that to a setting, you know, something oh about a setting that didn't have like sort of the normal rules of time and and you know different <laughs> different characters or groups encountered it or or you know had different you know ways of interacting with it. But I thought I thought it was kind of neat. It's just one of those things that. It didn't seem it sort of defied, you know, a straightforward explanation. And at times, it like you said, Jen, it seemed like psychological. But at other times, it's he's counting like the meals, and he's counting like you know, yeah. um, how many times he slept you know, in comparison to other people who didn't, you know, have that same experience. Wow, this was clearly an inspiration for Margaret St. Clair as well, mm. as, as I think back to the shadow people. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was also inspirational for Burroughs himself, right? I mean, this is the first of two series he had that dealt with, you know, kind of forgotten worlds with prehistoric creatures because he did the the series that began with uh, The Land That Time Forgot, mm. which is followed by The People That Time Forgot, and then there's a third book that has a different title. So I, so he, he liked to play with those sorts of things. And, of course, talk about your massive fan favorite crossovers. I mean, even Tarzan went to Pellucidar. <laughs> but did Tarzan meet David Inns? I don't know. I haven't read that story yet. But we own it, so you know, eventually, eventually we'll have to. But it just it was it was such a a pop culture in an age where pop culture was yeah not much, but it was definitely. A, hit the popular zeitgeist of, of people that read pulps and, and fantasy of that sort. Just fantastic stuff. Fantastic. Well, it, and it's and it's also like the, the science representation is very much of what people knew at the time, like all the you know references to you know ancient creatures and things like that. You can you can find it's it's very you know, I think David and Perry are talking about, you know, at one point you could concoct like any kind of like skeleton out of like a pig and, and things like that. And it's sort of like, people were very much like skeptics, right? You know, even, even this far in the time, but it's representing and bringing to the literary world, the people that are reading it, the culture of the time, because this is a lot, a lot of ways that people would have encountered, you know, a, a culture, this kind of evidence, right? You know, the, this is like, these things are real and they're living. And, and that's very, you know, I'm sure for the, the time is very fascinating, you know, because people probably had some of that skepticism still lingering from, you know, people, uh, you know, paleontologists who are maybe misappropriating or misrepresenting, you know, what the, the true, you know, sources of these things were, their false, false souls and things like that. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, just just <laughs> overall, when uh, when when Perry is talking about you can you can talk to any biologist or paleontologist and, and you know, they'll they'll say they believe this stuff, but. Right. I'm seeing this with my own eyes, and I realize that I did not believe right. the theories. I believe them now because I'm seeing it. It was just sort of this fantastic thing that that existed and we talked about and was accepted, but it wasn't real until the moment you saw it. And yeah, it kind of reminds me of like read all about it in their own library. Yeah, <laughs> it kind of reminds me when I was young and Jurassic Park came out, and it's like. Now I can understand, right? Because it's so 
visceral, you know, even though it was a movie, it's one of those kind of transitional moments that I think a lot of people point to to say, that's what, you know, draws me into like the the embodiment of how these creatures were instead of just a fossil or a description. Yeah. So. Well, shall we uh, move on in, from from the book and, and head over to the table and maybe uh, talk about some things to stat? Oh, I know you've got tons or or at least uh, tons of music for us. Well, we're, we're talking about things to stat, so. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, what do you come up with? Well, right off the bat, right? Dinosaurs, dinosaurs, and more dinosaurs. Oh. Uh, technically, all sorts of prehistoric sauropods because dinosaurs are from a particular period and all that but <laughs> you know the the fact that there were so many creatures from prehistory it just it took me back to the first time i opened up the uh the original monster manual and there was that whole section of dinosaurs that i never got mm -hmm. to use it was just there and, and there's so many wonderful things of, of that sort to stat um the the mehars or the mahars the 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 all-powerful mehars great reptiles and i like the way they're described as six or eight feet in length <laughs> yeah so it, it's like okay so they can be bipedal but they're not always bipedal um uh, they were they were really neat especially because they they've got the big you know serrated back fins and wings that connect by their legs and they were they were really wild, and, and then you add all their other abilities. Um, and I yeah, really they're thought, all female. <laughs> yes, and I also thought it would be really neat to stat up the iron mole. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's that's Some that's something that smell functions, right? <laughs> oh, I mean, that's something that you could drop <laughs> into MCC or DCC, right? Um, what if? what if in the midst of of an adventure the iron mole comes burrowing up and your world is actually in the hollow world as opposed to the other way around and and now it opens up something above yet below i thought there was a lot of cool things that you could play around with that um that that sort of weird science in the in the fantasy peanut butter can be a lot of fun so those those were the things that really really leapt out to me. What would be the the DC on that strength check to steer it though? Well, uh, since 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 Uberman um, ins <laughs> couldn't couldn't steer it with help, I'm thinking at least a DC thirty. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and only one person can help. Yeah. <laughs> what, but before we get to uh, to Mark's impressive uh, list of thoughts, Jen, what were you thinking? Uh, I was going back to the presentation of musicians to these creatures who don't speak because they can't hear. Mm -hmm. And I thought silent mm -hmm. music could be very interesting because they just if I recall, they just mimed playing the instruments and everything, because David had even said, if you didn't like the song, you could just look away. Uh, I thought I thought that was really a, a fun little touch. Uh, and Mark, like you were talking, the uh, time dilation would be really fun to stat up, maybe come up with a mechanic for that, uh, depending on which area you're in. And I'm really curious... Um, Actually, Mark has one that my thought ties into. Uh, I think you were mentioning that uh, fourth dimension speech. Mm -hmm. I love the way that was described. <laughs> yeah, it's is that is that a language? Is it a spell? Would comprehend languages work with it? I, oh, I, I have so many about questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love how it's described by Perry. He's like you know, it's fourth dimensional speech uh, that becomes sensible in the sixth sense to the listener. And he's like, do you understand, David? And David's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's that'd be, it, Yeah, I like that idea of like, what would magic, you know, do with these kind of like interactions? You know, I love, yeah, it's neat. Or well, how, and that's... how would that even work for for mechanics and, and all? Would it just be, well, PC's out of luck. Or do you give them some sort of check to try to learn it? I mean, 
-hmm. Could it be something that ends up on the language list where other characters can learn it as well? Yeah. Well, and it leaves me wondering, because I really don't know in, in things like mathematics and physics, when our understanding of time as the fourth dimension came about, and we're talking about how there's this weird time dilation, and maybe the use of four dimensional speech ties into that somehow, in, in that yeah. it, ref, it reflects the strange time dilation of, of Pellucidar. I, I don't know. I hadn't really thought about that too heavily. Could yeah, I think we, we'd have to go back to like what what the understanding of that would have been in Burroughs' time. But you're right; it could be representative of that. You know that they're somehow modifying or tapping into time, right? And that's that's sort of like then represented as um, you know this sort of telepathic you know ability, right? That's an explanation for it. So Which... I could either stat something up for this or write an essay on it. <laughs> <laughs> well and i'm i'm reminded in uh in the movie the the sagoth language was it was disconcerting to listen to because it was like chopped up bits of audio played at played at a, at a high rate of speed it wasn't like sped up and high pitched but it was just sort of this gr 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 garble sound and and that almost does seem reflective of time dilation yeah huh yeah okay so before we go too far down this rabbit hole mark <laughs> you had some really cool critters on your list i mean I, I, the mayhars uh were the most intriguing you know i think for for all of us we we kind of like tapped into that because they're really the only ones that are not sort of analogous to some prehistoric um you know megafauna or you know dinosaur or things like or sauropod and they they have these kind of like unique abilities the one thing I, I called it earlier but i love that sort of like hypnotism that they they use on their prey you know it's like this sort of bobbing and weaving dance very much you know like a you know hunter you know trying to to calm his victim down and and that's like a, a neat kind of special ability they have and they're sort of you know perry says that they're actually, you know, uh, a prehistoric creature, but they're much larger. He's never, you know, seen a fossil, you know, eight eight feet long. They're they're very much the size of like, you know, small uh, small cre you know, small mammals. Yeah, and and I love that. And and you know, playing up with the they can't hear. I love the the times in the story that that became so um, useful, right? You know, so you know, coming from a world where 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 sound is so important, David will also you know kind of call out. Oh, I didn't need to worry about making noise. I could sneak up on on them, but you know, it's sort of the counterpoint to that is that you know they have this sort of this extra sensory ability, you know, to to communicate and coordinate. Um, so I, I think they were really neat. But you know, I just as I was going through the novel, I started just listing out each of the unique creatures that were sort of like just briefly described and they and what analog they have. You know, so we had the sagas, which are these gorilla-like servants, which you know are are sort of menacing but they're very primitive they don't even have bows and arrows and they they you know have, throw hatchets you know for for their weapons and so modern technology can kind of defeat them easily you know when it's um when it's encountered the thipdars you know these are the the guards of the queen sort of like the honor guard but they're uh pterosaurs or pterodactyls you know so they're they're also described as dragons at one point so there's a sort of you know you know, more maybe they're maybe they're a little bit more dragon like. You know, I think at one point David's fighting one of them. He says it's just like a dragon out of you know medieval, you know, uh, descriptions. Um, but you know, the the fact that, they, that the queen has these creatures as their guards is kind of a neat thing. Um, there were a number of other ones like the Trandazors, You know, which um, in the which these are names within Pellucidor, but the those are Pleosaurs. Or the Asdrages, you know, which are ichthyosaurs, or Thangs, or Taregs. I, I just think it'd be really fun to come up with like this sort of, you know, unique, you know, uh, stats for each of these creatures, and then you could, like you said, the setting is maybe you, you know, you you transition to a world that's, um, you know, where these creatures are, or or maybe that this is a world that's brought to you and and your characters. Um, and so you can have a follow up because you, you can actually go to the descriptions or the the you know the the actual uh, prehistoric animal analog 
and kind of imagine what that would look like when it's statted up and how would PCs would encounter it. So um, yeah, that, I think this list is very is DCC pretty. though. These yeah. aren't things that you see everywhere. No, yeah. it's, it's not a Tarag. It's the Tarag. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it, and they're they're usually large and menacing, and you know uh, the unknown, right? That sort of thing that you, you said, Jen, is like DCC is all about. Yeah, you call it a a, a, a tharag or a fifth door, and you kind of describe it, but you know the the players are left sort of like you know wondering what what is what are its abilities? You know, I, I uh, and I like that aspect to the to the you know, using these uh, these creatures but giving them different names and. Um, Maybe some of them having different abilities too. Absolutely. Yeah, so fun. Um, let's move on. How about props, audio suggestions? Well, I, I think we know who has the market on that. Oh, but uh, do you have any props? <laughs> I came up with one prop, and I thought this is a, a great idea inspired by um, their their escape that they 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 wear the skins of the Maynards. Which you can tell where the story was going from the first time that uh, Ennis is like, "See those sleeping Mayhars? I think I've got an idea." He doesn't actually explain it until the very you know the end of the book, but basically they slit open the the dead bodies and wear the skins. And I I thought this is so improbable, but it's like one of these things that character or like players would do you know they would say uh, i i can just imagine this happening at a table like okay let's slit open the blue dragon and let's sort of put some poles up and you know sort of march down and try to we'll wear it like a cheap you know. suit yeah yeah and and i just love that idea that like you could you could play around with that do some some props to the table by you know getting some you know cloaks and some hoods and making you know players sort of you know do that as they're sort of sneaking along and and basing you know how well they do based on you know how how well they they do their sneak and and disguise self checks. So, so I, I I was kind of inspired just in terms of that would be a fun thing to do at the tables because you know players are going to go there in the game and and why not make them act it out you know for real. <laughs> uh, that was my my idea. I want to get back to including some props. You know we haven't done that in a while. So uh, thanks for suggesting that last time, Jen. I know and and Bob, you as always have the uh, the audio covered. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you, you you generally have a number of things that I'm unfamiliar with or, or hadn't come across. Uh, but what about what about you, Jen? Um, I have ellipses, so uh, it's all you. <laughs> okay, well then, uh, this show's Spotify playlist is about six and a half hours. But before you, you panic, uh, four and a half hours of that is the public domain audiobook of the story. So you can actually uh, you can listen to At the Earth's Core from uh, LibriVox recordings. Um, I was really it was really tough, kind of trying to to think what sort of things would be good to listen to to, to set a, a vibe or, uh, or or the mood. Ooh. And then I, I came across I came across a pair of soundtrack albums: Jurassic Sounds One and Prehistoric Nature Sound Effects. Uh, both of which have like herds of pterosaurs and the cry of a tyrannosaurus rex and all sorts of weird things like that. So that was a, for me, that was a, a good sort of starting and jumping off point. Um, since, since we deal a lot with like caveman societies, I figured uh, you know, drums would be a, a, another good way to go. So there was a jungle drums beat, which is just from a, a another like, stock sound Probably effects album idea. and uh jungle drums by morton gould and his orchestra which is a little bit more you know, musical and fun um then i started leaping into movie soundtracks right uh the 1933 king kong soundtrack by max stein um, max reift's theme from king solomon's mines uh chris ridenauer's the land that time forgot your music from that movie and then I then I, I I dipped back to King Kong and the whole you know, lost island thing. So I went to John Barry's work from the 1976 King Kong, and there's a couple songs from there. That one has a lot more modern music. The album itself isn't great uh, for for our purposes, but like the opening and and the sacrifice, see, yeah. climb to Skull Island were great. Um, the the uh, more recent movie Kong Skull Island. 
the soundtrack by Henry Jackman has Kong the Destroyer, another great kind of primal, weird jungle feeling song. And, and then I stopped and I turned left for a minute because I, I kept thinking of this novelty song from like the 50s uh, that I once had on a three LP set called 40 Funky Hits, which is uh, difficult to find. And it's the song Stranded in the Jungle by the Cadets. And that, that for me was kind of a good breaking point from let's take this real seriously to now we're going to transition to other music. Um, so then there's At the Earth's Core, which is a, a song by a Dutch band called the Hemorrhoids. <laughs> and it actually talks about drilling down into the earth. The entire cover of that album is dinosaurs and the iron mole coming up through the ground. And uh, there is a kind of gore grind metal group called Caveman Attack. And uh, they also they released kind of a demo album called The Cave Demo. And it's got some great stuff as well. If you want to go, you know, darker, more metal primal beats. So that's that's what I had there. A lot of soundtracks, some sound effects stuff, and then some kind of off the wall choices that just made it a lot of fun. Nice, I love those. That's going to take us to my favorite section now. Keep remarks, word of the day. <laughs> <laughs> it's turned into like words of the day. Yeah, it's become as verbose as Jack Vance. <laughs> I was expecting to, you know, actually find a lot more <laughs> um words because it, you know, this this kind of period is very, you know, much in that sort of like flowery language, you know, uh, you know, the, like Lord Jassini and 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 a lot of the sort of like Lovecraftian precursors. However, you know, there's there there's not as much of that, but there are a few good words, you know, that I really enjoyed, you know, calling out. So my my list is a little short, but it's you know I'll start with supinely, you know, which is a I kind of love how that word sounds. Felicitate, um, duar or duar, which is a small encampment in in like that he encounters in the Sahara. Burled, I love that word. It's it's the first time I encountered it, and it's oh I like that. Yeah, he's it's describing like how the the earth formed and like these these sort of masses burled out, you know, to to basically create the you know Pellucidar uh, land uh, land areas, garmenture, um, which you can tell is a you know word for clothing, but it's you know very much an out of use word. I love the slang. There's a few examples I mentioned. Corker, you know, that's just a fun word to say. There's a point when David is describing his you know his running style, and he's saying you know I was I was really good at like pitching and and doing all these kind of athletic things, but you know they they they, they always tease me about my running. They called me ice wagon and you know, I, I think the other one that it was something like um, call a cab, you know, and they, like these sort of like call outs for, you know, uh, slang, you know, saying you're you slow. I, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last one I have is mutation, which is um, very much like procession, which is this idea, you know, in terms of like the earth is not quite, um, you know, even in its uh, in its axis. And so over time, the stars actually, you know, realign themselves. So like the North Star now was not the new north star 10,000 years ago right so there's this idea that inside the the hall earth what does procession look like and and perry you know calls out mutation um so that's a fun word too so a lot of these i you know just i was reading along and just saw them so you know jen i i noted the the oed frequency band for you and um you know we can and, we can and that last represent. one was was mutation with an n as opposed to yes, an not M, M, like, N. like our MCC fans might be used to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. That's probably my not an M. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My favorite, I think, Bob, is the one that you like to, which is burled. I just like how that, that sort of sounds and how little used it's, it is. So. Yeah. No, yeah, that, really, that cool. really is kind of a... Yeah. Yeah, um, it's just got a nice feel to it. Yeah good word uh, for mouth sounds which uh well let's move on to the next section so Finally, yes jen uh, what about well, of course reskins we have part? of course we have reskins and existing products out there that fit so well into this this is just ripe for dcc right mm -hmm. uh, i was thinking especially with kind of the uh dinosaur quality to these creatures you could easily start with not in Kansas anymore, which is one of Peter Zimmerman's, I believe, our feature for last show. 
and uh, use that as a springboard into any of the modules that Bob's going to mention. Um, <laughs> the, the whole sneaking around the ceremonial area really brought to mind uh, the last act of the heist, which I think was 2020's DCC Day Adventure Pack. Um, it was the Lankmar adventure in that. And it it's just a, a great dive into the underbelly of uh, Lankmar and some of their secrets that happen behind this backstage, we'll say. Uh, of course, we're we're probably both going to talk about, or all of us are going to talk about Agarda, <laughs> right? Lost Agarda. Mm -hmm. uh, the Pits of Lost Agarda was published in Goodman Games' yearbook. I want to say this year, or the one that came out at Gen Con, which would have been the one with 2022 in its title. Mm -hmm. uh, those of you who play tested it with us long, long ago and during things like Empire of the Cyclops Con would know it as the Slave Pits of Lost Agarda, but of course we dropped the first word for that printing. Uh, there is a great little zero level funnel called Escape from the Purple Planet, which you could use to mirror the whole the whole book, really. Uh, and then Bob, since I know you really like the uh, the Iron Mole, I do. We, ha we have some makeshift <laughs> vehicles for your inter global uh, inter globe. Uh, spatial travel thing for you um against the atomic overlord by edgar johnson or the tower out of time by michael curtis either will get you where you need to go probably totally different flavors um, it could be the iron mole out of time or they could be the same yeah. thing i or this could just be i mean it all goes back to lankmar for me right it could just be a world bubble or part of ningobble's cave yeah. Totally fair. Totally fair. Mark, how about you? Yeah, uh, Pits of Lost Argartha, if folks have not had a chance to, you know, read that, um, or more importantly, join one of the Gen Cons or conventions where two fans created a model for oh my Pits goodness. of Lost Argartha. That yes. gets so much attention and so much it's so much fun to play because it's you know, it's it's, it's lovely done. And I, I wish I remember the names of the the the, the two fans that did that. Um, hey, Chase Reinhardt, but I don't remember his friend's name uh, who did the miniatures. But Chase did the uh, cigarette. Oh, the cigarette. Yeah, it's it's awesome, and uh, hopefully, you know, people will get a chance to check that out. Um, yes. Bob, you have so many of these covered, but I thought I'd throw out a couple that um, that just came to mind. You know, one, and this is a bit of a self plug, so I feel. You know, like a, a little bit uh, saying this, but Dinosaur Croft Classics, you know, which is a yes, oh, you know, so I mean, up I your alley. It was, it was in, in a Good Me Games yearbook um, many years ago. I still think but, it should have been Velociraptor Claw Classics. Twenty you know. seven, no, uh, twenty seventeen, I believe. Yeah, we you play tested that at uh, North Texas, didn't you? In sixteen. Yeah, yeah, it was so fun to to play test, and it was one of those sort of like I found a a, a role playing game called uh, uh, Brontosaurus Rex that apparently you know was uh, Joseph Goodman's one of his early products, and I found that at a half price book. So I thought that's be great to to take to North Texas, you know. And uh, thankfully, I had the opportunity to actually write some of that up. Um, but it was fun, you know, because you, you can stat out the dinosaurs, and it's very much in line with you know the things that we're talking about, you know, as far as statting things. So. Um, so check that out. Um, but um, you know, certainly I enjoyed uh, that as a as a setting. The other one that came up that in my mind is that it's not DCC, but it's Metamorphosis Alpha. There's a module or adventure called The Level of the Lost uh, by Michael Curtis, and it's a great opportunity to reskin that because you know these are you know you're in the um, you know the 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 gene ship or the you know the the ship that is is lost in metamorphosis alpha and you encounter this sort of like 
primitive world and it's very fun you know it's one of these kind of deadly encounters because there's so much that you can do in metaphors of alpha that you roll a bunch of six-sided and you die <laughs> so, yeah um but yeah check that out for people who haven't played metamorphs alpha even if you haven't used that system you can take that um that module and uh, reskin it for something very pellucidar uh themed so. and as a quick side note if i may there's actually a uh, metamorphosis alpha game starting uh every saturday here in fort wayne uh, courtesy of wow. foxy dj foxy yeah that is awesome wow. and as <laughs> as massive of a metamorphosis alpha fan as i am i am i am ashamed that i didn't think of the level of the loss that is a that is a great call mark because that I love it that really fits because in the world of nice deep fit of well in the world of the starship warden it's this locked off sealed area that that nobody knew about so you as you go through these massive doors it's sort of like penetrating down into the earth and going to this other world that's a that's a really good call i like that um obviously i will join everybody else with uh pits of lost agartha right i mean that's yeah, that, that just kind of goes yes, without saying yes bidding. <laughs> release the man bats um that that's Come just on, absolutely Elena. fantastic um there is of course uh dcc day number one shadow of the beak man mm -hmm. uh which which to me oh. you know the, the beak man certainly had a very uh mayhar vibe although i reached out to harley to ask him if if uh the beak man was inspired at all by by the mayhar and he admitted that they were not but mm. uh, but uh, but I, I i see the similarities and i was i was still very excited um there is skeeter green has done um, a number of things there's a valley out of time series for mcc um, exploring the valley welcome to the valley etc and uh, those are are really great kind of prehistoric forays for MCC and uh, Skeeter Green also along with uh, Jeffrey Seifert did Underland um, and Underland is kind of meant to be kind of this ongoing series and it's it's really more grounded in in more traditional fantasy but again you know underground travel giant lizard things and lost races would be very easy to reskin for uh, Pellucidar. Um, there is the jungle incursion into the lair of the Batman, which is just, I mean, it's just a gorgeous adventure to begin with, right? I mean, you just, the, the, the cover itself will just kind of catch your attention and carry you away. And that's from uh, Silver, Silver Boulet, <laughs> uh, as opposed to Silver Bullet. Uh, Silver Boulet, and that's Independent Publishers Union. Yeah, yeah, that's Ian McGarty, I think it is. McGarty, okay. And, uh, and that is another kind of MCC adventure with you know an ancient facility and and weird things in the jungle, and it has Batman, so it ties into uh, Lost Agartha. Uh, so so there's that. Um, then there is, uh, well, there's a pair of, of free downloads. There's an adventure by Daniel Bishop mm -hmm. called The Tribe of Og and the Gift of Sus, which, oh, is, is, fun. which is from Mystic Bull. And uh, you're actually playing the, the cavemen, and it's a, it's a fun adventure dealing with, with another tribe and, and sort of inner conflict there. And then we eventually did an authorized sequel. I spoke with uh, with everybody involved, and we did a sequel called "The Tribe of Og and the Trials of Moss." Hmm. Um, that also is available as a as a free download in our episode forty one companion on Drive Through. So you can you can really get your caveman on. As a matter of fact, uh, Trials of Moss comes with. Uh, I, a character sheet for you know specific for that setting and expands on on what daniel bishop laid down because it's it's just a fun world and having an opportunity to play in it was was nice what was and episode then, 41 i'm trying to i'm struggling to remember that was right around um, free rpg day because that that issue was translated into portuguese 
by the original DCC uh, license holders in Brazil and was released yeah. in the 90s as well. Um, yeah, I don't remember. And then finally, kind of leading in to, uh, to our feature, there is DCC 91.1 and DCC 91.2, the lost city of uh, Morocco and layers of lost Agarta which are are set in you know deep beneath the surface of of earth and layers of lost agarta especially with you know monster layers and caves and weird little places and and the lost city of of, of uh, morocco both just scream pellucidar and uh, they would barely take any work to to make more Pellucidarian, I guess, uh, for for uh, lack of, of a uh, less tongue twisting word. So that's kind of my list of, of wow, I, I could use this and this and this. So many wonderful things and some great third party stuff. Very comprehensive. I love that. That was, that was 40, the 41 uh, companion. I don't know that it was actually related to episode 41 although it was uh gone with the gods by andrew offit um, yeah okay that's a good yeah it, it was a short story by by Alfred. yeah uh, yeah but speaking of episode tie-ins uh this one is a no-brainer for all of us, I believe. Uh, <laughs> we're going DCC number 91 before the point one and point two, Journey to the Center of Aerith by Harley Stroh. The stories have reached you. A world beneath our own, lit by a brilliant sun and ruled by sages beyond reproach, where magic has replaced the spoken word, the weakest slave is like unto a superman, and the domes gleam with hammered gold. You've spilled enough blood to know better. Your trek to discover the truth will take you through endless caverns, ancient causeways, and along unknown rivers. An expedition worthy of true explorers, Journey to the Center of Earth offers characters the adventure of a lifetime, or the means to a quick doom. The journey awaits. And this is a t-shirt I regret not getting. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely no brainer. Um, the Agartans are uh, humanoid slash elephantine creatures and are absolutely the uh, equivalent, if you will, to the Mayhars, uh, just subbed in for the, the lizard or, or dinosaur folk, right? Uh, complete with the Sagarth to uh, uh, the the little minions that were holding the hostages. Sagarths. Well, Sagarths. And, Sorry, and, not not Garth. <laughs> Sagoth. <no. laughs> and the yeah. Agartans, uh, as an interesting note, are meant to be the same race as the. Uh, the captor in Robert E. Howard's Tower of the Elephant. Oh, right. Yes, the the captive uh, alien creature. Yeah, so yeah. it hardly it, drew on a lot of... It's really a nice things. blend, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah. this is a, a, a excellent setting. You know, so rereading this has sort of refreshed my, my memory of this when it came out, being mm -hmm. just so, so large and just so, so comprehensive. And it kind of feels like this is like one of the forgotten, you know, sort of settings that doesn't get much play or mention or use, but it is deep and comprehensive and full of great ideas, you know. So I do want to highlight this just because I, I think it's it's worth, you know, DCC fans or fans of any kind of like, you know, appendix and genre. Um, this is something that's, you know, I think is equivalent to Harley's other works like Purple Planets and, you know, all the richness that comes with those those kind of deep dives. And so definitely worth checking out for, for those that are not familiar with it. 
Oh my yeah. goodness, the well, art. <laughs> And I, I feel that it tends to get looked over as a setting because unlike, you know, Purple Planet, Shutter Mountains, Lankmar, it it doesn't have its own box set. It's mm. got a mat, what, like a 50-some page, we'll call it a module, but it's really an adventure and setting book and hex crawl and, and two follow-up adventures or one and, and more setting info, really. Um, it's it's absolutely fantastic, and Harley even name drops Pellucidar as as one of the the influences. Uh, the, the line is echoes with traces of Edgar Rice Burroughs's Pellucidar. Mm -hmm. It's 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 flat out listed as an inspiration there, and just because it's set up as this marvelous weird world hex crawl in this in this subterranean yet strangely lit world with was it like the blood marshes and it, all these all these the great shores yes yeah and of course it has man bats and you can't go wrong with man bats. <laughs> but it's just so yeah. rich and, and there's, there's lots of like these kind of like you know random tables that are sort of interspersed throughout it that you could easily you know take and you know use in another context you know there's like there's a dark pool that you can you can drink from and it has like these kind of like effects. There's this kind of neat mechanic is the further you get delve into air, yes. that, you know, that you have this sort of modification of your strength because the gravity is sort of, you know, it becomes different. And that's why, you know, these supermen exist down there. And and those are really things that you could imagine sort of taking and and using in, in another context if you're not wanting to dive in you know completely in this world so Harley came up with a lot of his creative ideas and you know just for that alone is kind of worth just reading through the, the adventure well and, and the it, journey itself could be played as a con game if you wanted it just take the adventure layout from the first what 16 18 pages the, the actual descent portion yeah yes. Yes. Which I mean was was brilliant. I mean Harley Harley essentially starts you at a giant cave opening at the North Pole, which is again one of the uh, one of the classic. Even Vance agrees that it's one of the classic Hollow Earth entrance <laughs> theories. Yeah, uh, uh, it, can't go a single show. Yeah, and <laughs> and the world is so large. I mean, we're talking about a hex crawl where a hex is is 50 miles and in a day you could be expected to cover 15 so mm -hmm. it takes you more than three days to cover a hex in this world and it's it's a big map and there's you know random tables and places you can find and so it it never gets dull it's it's a setting as well as sort of a a prep kit for a judge who has no idea what to run on saturday but gets to the game store and needs to run something yeah, you can exactly. just pull this open and and go take them down into into the hollow earth and go yeah. for it. You know, yeah, like you said, it's got these. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, like like you said, it's got these kind of like extra supplemental materials, like the the two point one, you know, point one point two, but it's also got the pits of of Agartha, you know, which you could. It's in itself is like sort of a scene you can imagine, like you know, the the you know, the contestants or the PCs are are. Uh, you know, suddenly in an arena battle, you know, which is, um, oh, you yeah, know, we could totally do a, a mini tournament with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you could yeah, use, that would be fun for Gary Khan. <laughs> you could use pits of Agartha as the, uh, the hollow earth equivalent of a Lankmar meet, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, here, here you are, you can, you can fight against each other and kill each other, or you can work together to try and escape, but you're not the only people here. Mm hmm go and because uh this would be a real deadly place for a funnel it'd be a very very deadly <laughs> deadly place for a funnel um oh and my god met harley right and oh. some of the some of the monsters <laughs> some of the some of the creatures these like stalactites that that ooze and drip slime and are and are alive but they're not they're not the stereotypical like piercer from D and D. They're they're different and, and horrific and, and just gooey. Um, yeah, yeah, so much goodness. Yeah, and I I keep talking about wanting to go back to Lankmar, but the more I look through this, it's all in one book. 
I can use Fleeting Luck if I want. I can grab another, uh, I can grab a third party module or supplement and throw stuff in it, make a nice little soup if I wanted, or just run it straight as within the confines of these pages. Mm -hmm. And it would still be, I mean, months of enjoyment. Yeah, I, this is a, it's a, it's, it, you could be very expensive with this, or like you said, you could just narrow it down and run into the con. I, I'm very tempted just, just like, I want to give this um, more attention. So maybe this would be one of the games I run at Gary Con this year or this next year. So just to, to get more eyes on it. It could be easily run online without having to do any like mapping too. Mm -hmm. Just need a couple of visual dig up a couple of visuals for uh some of the critters yeah. maybe share some of the art from the book i i think this would be just amazing so i'm actually really happy with the way this episode has come out because we all enjoyed the book and yes. we're all very appreciative of the module at hand and the revelation that there are so many things that can work with this. So I hope our listeners are taking some of this to heart and yeah, go out there and mash up some Appendix N into your DCC. <laughs> it needs it. I'm hoping Harley takes this to heart and we get a 91.3. <laughs> um, he's, I mean, he's, got a, he's got a little Kickstarter coming yeah. up that, uh, that he needs to <laughs> support first. I, I, yeah, yeah. There's, there's probably not a whole lot of brain work necessary to figure out what January is going to be about. <laughs> January or February. Um, but I, I think we're all uh, pretty happy with the direction things are going. Uh, while our relocation has caused some delays in some of the Sanctum Sequorum projects. Um, we shall be returning shortly. However, we have some really exciting news to announce to everyone. <laughs> Mark your calendars for Saturday, December 9th. That's 2023. Sorry if you're listening late. Uh, it's going to be at 4 p.m. Eastern right here on this Twitch channel for the next episode of Sanctum Secorum Live. We will have author and living legend Michael Moorcock back with us. He is returning to answer some new viewer questions and further discuss his body of work. So we hope you'll join us for that. Uh, if you are enjoying the show, please do the regular stuff. Comment on the podcast. Uh, help us by posting reviews on iTunes or YouTubes. Uh, these ratings and reviews really help new listeners find both the podcast and the DCC community. Be sure to turn, tune in tomorrow night here on the Twitch channel. That's Wednesday, November 15th at 8 p.m. Eastern for the live Goodies Award show. Next month, that would be December, right? Yep. Right month? Yeah. Already. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, we are plunging into The Blue Star by Fletcher Pratt. I don't know if we've covered any Pratt besides like the uh, complete enchanter long, long ago. It, it's so, been a very long time since we've done so it. Pratt. It'll be really interesting. So, Any last thoughts, folks? Well, um, the year's almost over, and uh, season four of the Sanctum Decorum starts in just a couple months. Uh, Jen, Mark, and I are kind of throwing our ideas around on, on what Appendix N and Appendix N adjacent stuff we might cover. So if there's something that you really think that, uh, that we would be remiss in by not covering, drop us an email and let us know, and we can uh, look it over and and see if it makes our list of books for 2024. And that email is thehub at sanctum.media. Mark? I was just going to say that next month you get a double dose of uh, Sanctum because we have the Michael Moorcock, and then just a few days after that we'll be doing our Fletcher Pratt episode. Um, yeah. 
and I hope next year we can wow. also kind of re redo what we did this year in terms of publishing out um you know the the list of um uh, works in advance so that readers get a chance to follow along and um you know look and at us too and us too <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really I have have a list. <laughs> yeah keep that um, bookmark right on your desk yeah so looking forward to next year and another year of sanctum oh and uh look for legends of uganda to land uh fairly soon at the goodman games online store Ooh. awesome that's great yeah might not make it in time for Black Friday, but we'll have it in time for the holidays. <laughs> the other holidays. Yeah. Uh, so there we have it. We hope we've inspired you. Thanks for listening. Be inspired. <laughs>